Hello, thanks for tuning in. My name is Savannah Sly. You're watching a recording of the first SpokesHub graduation, which was held at the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Summit in Alexandria, Virginia on August 5th, 2022. Due to a technical glitch, I'll be narrating the introduction of this video. The purpose of SpokesHub is to support advocates in developing their voice and authority on complex issues. Our goal is to create spaces where advocates can dialogue with their peers about the nuances of their shared issue areas. The current SpokesHub cohort is focused on the topic of the sex trade. Graduates will be reading excerpts from essays that touch upon discrimination, exploitation, the prison system, gender, race, and disability as they all relate to the sex trade. All right, we've got our audio back. Now let's go watch the show. I feel like they have to know everything when they're talking to a journalist, a classroom, a potential ally, a lawmaker, but also it's easy to misspeak on certain subjects within the sex trade. Um, I, for instance, had a lot to learn about sex work in immigration and HIV policy. I had my own experiences, but I had a lot to learn from my peers. So we want to create a space where people from different backgrounds could come and learn about all of our different experiences and also identify which um, spokes off the hub, off of the issue of sex work. We felt like we had a lot to share. Uh, how can we cultivate our own expertise? What is it that we want to teach? So, uh, for the past four months, uh, we've had a group of uh, five of us total in this pilot program. Um, it's been co-led by myself, Savannah Sly, and also Noah Supreme, thought scholar, another fantastic writer and thinker on this issue. Um, and we're really excited tonight to just share some of the writing that has come out of this program. So without further ado, um, we have Molly Henderson. Um, Zooming in, we're so excited to have her. I'm gonna read her bio. Molly Henderson is a survivor of sex trafficking and a former sex worker. She was unjustly incarcerated and forced to register as a sex offender due to her unknowing proximity to a minor who was also involved in the sex trade. Molly is a loving mother who wants to educate the public on the shortcomings of the criminal justice system. So without further ado, let's give it up for Molly Henderson. Hi, my name is Molly. I'm going to read an excerpt from a piece that I wrote. In 2016, I met a black man named Darian who responded to one of my ads on Backpage. He was actually a pimp who lived in Macon, Georgia. Soon after we parted ways with Chelsea, I found out that I was pregnant. I cried. I did not want to have another baby that I could not care for. I knew that my lifestyle was not the proper environment for a baby. He was happy. He said that he wanted me to be the mother of his child, that he always wanted to have a baby with a white woman. Before the week is over, Darian starts telling me that if I loved him, I'd be stuffing his pockets. He tries to get me up at 8 a.m. to post my ad and catch the morning rush. Makes me feel bad when I want to go to sleep before 2 a.m. He is taking all of the money that I make and yet is still not enough. He finds other women on Backpage and tries to get us to work as a team, often from other states. It never works out for various reasons. In October 2016, I gave birth to my third daughter. She was born a perfectly healthy, beautiful baby. In the beginning of 2017, Derry mentioned to me that he met some girl off of Backpage and that he is going to pick her up from another pimp in Macon. Despite my protests, he brings this girl to my house. He insists that I help work her and I refuse. He threatens me again, using our child as leverage, saying that I will never see my daughter again. I'm intimidated. I'm scared. I realized I have no ground to stand on. I ended up giving in, like I always do, afraid of the outcome if I didn't. The next morning, her first date shows up while I'm cleaning the bathroom. After a few minutes pass, I hear a very loud banging on my front door. I go to the door and open it. I'm immediately picked up off my feet and placed outside my front door. I realize that there are several white officers in uniform with weapons drawn. He then yells for anyone in the house to come out with their hands visible. After some time, Kylie and the unknown male client come out of the room. They are both cuffed immediately. At this point, they look at me and say, do you know that she is 15 years old? I believe that my jaw probably hit the ground. I had absolutely no idea she was a minor. The officers interrogated me for some time. 
asking all kinds of questions. They ask if they are going to find me on back page as well. What's the point of lying? All they have to do is look. I am there. Four months later, warrants were issued on both Darian and I. Prostitution of a minor, pimping of a minor, sexual exploitation of a minor, enticing a minor for indecent purposes, keeping a place for the purposes of prostitution of a minor, and prostitution. Both of us charged individually as co-defendants. In December 2019, my attorney, a white man, who if I'm going by looks, could very well have been one of my clients, offered me a plea deal. I agree to testify against Darian. My judge, also a white man, who again could have been a client, sentenced me to 20 years. After I testify, I go back to court for a resentencing hearing and am sentenced to four years prison with six years of probation. I was never told that I would have to register as a sex offender. I would have not agreed to this deal if I had been informed of this. At this point, I just want to go home and be a mother to my daughter. I go to prison just after the new year 2020. When I finish the intake process, I am shipped to Pulaski State Prison in Hawkinsville, Georgia. When I meet with my counselor for the first time, she informs me that I will have to register as a sex offender upon my release and for the rest of my life. My release date is set for September 5th, 2021, with no eligibility for parole. While in prison, I attend all of the groups and classes that I'm required to take, including the sex offender class. This class was designed for pedophiles and rapists, neither of which I am. Several times while I was in prison, I was targeted by others for being a sex offender, and I was involved in several fights where I was attacked, leaving me with a scar across my chest. I'm released from prison in 2021. I immediately report to probation. I am allowed to stay in Florida while a probation transfer is put in. This first transfer is denied. My probation officer then puts another transfer through, which is again denied. She informs me that I am to return to Georgia or violate my probation. I'm about to lose everything I have just worked to, so hard to get back. My partner, my child, my support system, my job, everything. I run a few addresses by the sex offender registration officer, all of which will not work with the Georgia specifications for sex offenders. I have to live and work at least a thousand feet away from a school, church, daycare, bus stop, and playground. He then informs me that if I'm going to take the homeless route, that I can stay in the Walmart parking lot or a rundown hotel known for drugs and prostitution. I choose the Walmart parking lot no longer willing to put myself in those environments. With it being winter and all, I don't know how long the money I have will last at this rate. Thankfully, I had just enough money to be able to start up the, the car a few times a night to warm up the inside. Now I'm alone in a city where I know no one, living in a car in the Walmart parking lot. I'm running out of money. I cannot go to a shelter or a rehab because I'm a sex offender. I cannot stay with anyone who has children. As a matter of fact, I had to get a court order stating that I have permission to be around and live in the same home with my own children. So what am I to do? I have to make this work because it is the only choice I have. Saving money is almost impossible. My fiance and daughter come to visit me for about five days each month. That is all we can afford at the hotel I'm allowed to stay at. Update, with the help of swap behind bars and several private donors, I was able to buy a camper. The mother of a sex worker that was murdered happened to have a camper she was no longer living in. I found a campground approved by my probation and am currently living in my camper in Georgia. I work all the time and still struggle to save money, but I am somewhat more stable. This helps. I still only see my family once a month due to probation and limited funds. Hopefully soon that will change too. I will say that without the support that I have received, I don't think I would have made it. I am definitely one of the lucky ones. Ricky was murdered and her killer never brought to justice. Molly Henderson, everyone, SpokesHub graduate. And Molly, I, I, don't, I know it's kind of hard to hear the microphone over the technology, um, but it's been amazing to have you in this class and to hear your experience, and we're just so proud of you for joining us and for telling your story like you have. Congratulations on this graduation. Thank you.
Next up, we have Nikki Gilliland. Um, Nikki is a former sex worker and currently a full-time law student at the University of Massachusetts. She plans on specializing in sex worker civil rights after graduation. After nearly a decade in emergency medicine, Nikki was run out of nursing school by her professors when they found out about her past in sex work. She sued for discrimination under Title IX and succeeded in getting a federal court to reason that the law could be used in this way. Nikki now serves on the board of Swap Behind Bars and is an ambassador to the Woodhull Freedom Foundation. Let's give it up for Nikki Gilliland. I'm not nervous at all. Um, first, I just really want to say thank you to Woodhull. Um, I was fresh out of homelessness in 2019 and traumatized to hell when I came here and found a community. So thank you, and thank you to Swap Behind Bars and folks have, um, it just means the world to, to come back here a few years later and be in the position I'm in now. So, oh, I'm not gonna start crying already. Okay, um, this is called Justice Served. My legal battle against my former college started over four years ago. Four very long years ago. It started after my teacher, advisor, and mentor discovered I had been a sex worker a decade prior. She told me unclassy women shouldn't be nurses. Her name was Melissa, and she had turned on me so quickly that I'm still dizzy, to it, dizzy from it to this day. Melissa drove me out of nursing school by giving me fake assignments, trying to have me expelled, changing my grades, and completely ostracizing me from my other classmates and teachers. Not only did nobody stop her, but her superiors helped her. I filed complaints with every possible authority. Nobody cared. The only recourse left I had was civil action, so I filed my lawsuit. I sued for discrimination under Title IX, as well as breach of the school's anti-discrimination contract. The day of the verdict, I had spent the day preparing myself for bad news. A jury had, the jury had a question uh, that had been posed that, that morning that sounded like we were about to lose. They asked, if we decide no on Title IX, do we still consider the breach of contract claim? Upon hearing this, my heart sank. It had been an intense and exhaustive trial that filled nearly two weeks. Four years of struggling for justice hinged on this final moment. Although it now appeared that it was not going to end well, I started to pick myself back up. It had been an incredible trial. Although difficult, I could not think of anything that could have gone better. I had a legal dream team, an incredible judge, attentive jury, strong evidence, and the defendant said even managed to suck perfectly. We had given it our absolute best shot and found the peace to be found was in that, not in the outcome. After an excruciating long day of waiting, we were finally called back for the verdict. The long deliberation was a good sign according to my legal team. It's easy to say no, yes takes longer. Juror seven is announced as the foreperson, another good sign. She had made the most eye contact with me over the course of the trial. Judge Kasavai begins to read the verdict in his almost godlike, perfect for radio hosting voice. No on the Title IX. On breach of contract, yes. Full economic damages of 735,000. Non-economic damages of 1 million. This was the first time anyone with power to do anything about what had happened at the school said it was not okay and the jury had just done it in a big way. I started silently crying so hard that my mask started filling with tears. I fought so hard for so long to obtain any form of justice that I could get, and I had just been given it. I felt the weight of the burden I'd been carrying lift, and I felt so much lighter. This had never been about money. This had been about accountability, justice, and validation. What I need to heal from now is the fact that it took a lawsuit and a trial to get anything done. So many people with power to stop and correct what had been done had chosen to do nothing. I fought back because if one vindictive and insignificant bigot could snap her fingers and take away my many years of hard work, anyone could, and no future would be safe. I fought back and I won. I would not wish this on anyone, yet this discrimina discrimination happens all the time. The next person who is tempted will think twice before meddling in my life. Institutions around the country will think twice before bringing harm to someone based on sex work or slut shaming. Most importantly, let this victory be the empowerment you need to fight back if it happens to you. Thanks.
let's give it up for Nikki Gilliland. Yes. An inspiration to us all, making big changes out of necessity. And we're just so glad that you are through with this. We're so glad that you're through with this. Yeah. So we now have our final speaker, who is also the co-coordinator for Spokes Hub. Uh, Moses Moon, also known as Thought Scholar, is a writer and self-made scholar whose work focuses on race and racialization, sexuality, gender, and genre. She is a former member of SWAP USA's Board of Directors and has made a name for herself through questioning stale conventions and highlighting racial, sexual, and socioeconomic entanglements. Her work has been published in the Yale LPE blog, Columbia Human Rights Law Review, Vice, Afropunk, and Duke University's SAQ. Her book, Low End Theory, is forthcoming. You can sign up for her Substack at thoughtscholar.substack.com or you can follow her on Twitter at thoughtscholar. Without further ado, Thought Scholar. just setting up my own camera. <laughs> I'm like super nervous. There we go. So um, I, my piece was inspired by my experience with online harassment for the past few years. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, the most interesting thing was someone claiming that I wasn't like a full service full-time, full-service sex worker. So that's what like prompted this piece, this idea that this person and I had so many like shared major identities, but in reality, there was like a lot of differences with us, even though we're the same race and the same sex, and we're bisexuals in a heterosexual relationship at the time. My circumstances were wildly different because of cultural differences and socioeconomic differences and having a kid and all of these different things. So that's, uh, that's what prompted me to look at the idea of women as like just the label of women as like this sort of hegemonic class in a way that I hadn't thought of before. So Sharon Patricia Holland wrote that sexuality emerges and becomes recognized in the severance of the erotic from racist practice from the pornographic so that reproduction the province of feminism can be dispensed with and the act of forgetting what biology is for racial belonging procreating can commence and she wrote that in the book the erotic life of racism it's a pretty good book to embrace black as a concept is often characterized as backward and essentialist. However, race is still a central organizing method in the Western world and has wide ranging material and socioeconomic effects, rivaled only in the US, rivaled only by disability. There is empirical evidence that supports this conclusion. My goal with my work is to uncover how popular queer theory and feminism queered has attempted to follow and apply French post-structuralist impulses tacitly ignoring reproduction and racial embodiment, implicitly tying these issues to the modern concept of heterosexuality. Last year, I began a series of critiques regarding the tacit racialization of the term cisgender after noticing how cis het shorthand for cisgender heterosexual was deployed against those whose profile pictures language or stance on certain issues mark them as black and or male, thus presumably heterosexual. The rules of queer engagement did not seem to apply to those who looked like black men. How can we not see this as a slippery slope? I think of black women who look like Castor Semenya, Venus Williams, Aminatou Saini, Margaret Wambui, and Francine Nionsava. Where is the intersectional analysis for those whose features and bodies defy white heterogender norms? Black people ourselves are positioned as non-heteronormative, yet we dare not utilize the concept of queer to describe it. 
We've been told in more ways than one that this is not ours to reclaim. Yet every paradigm, every concept has been patterned on our experiences to a certain degree. Aliyah Abdul Rahman wrote that sexuality is a crucial component of racial difference. Rahman theorizes that blackness and queerness are used to short whiteness, while Shinsuke Eguchi provides us with the conceptualization of queerness as strategic whiteness, whiteness reconfigured as the norm of gay sexual cultures. In order to work my way toward my much larger project of a carnal generative politic, I must first tease out how certain situations such as disability, negative racialization, racialized sexuality, and freakdom cause me to recognize woman alongside man as a hegemonic class. For all intents and purposes, I am a negress, black, female, freak following yet also diverging from Sharon Patricia Holland's work on the material function of the erotic. My desire is to wage battle against the biologism embedded in certain practices that reproduce race. When the word sex took on erotic qualities in the 20th century, the word gender replaced it to describe genital. When we dig into its origins, we find that it comes from the old French genre or genre from the Latin stem genus, race, stock, family, kind, rank, order, species. If we run it back to the 13th century, we get kind, sort, class, a class or kind of persons or things sharing certain traits. As a negress marked as Negro and female, I no longer have the desire to reclaim queer. It is not that I don't understand or appreciate the work that black intellectuals are doing under the banner of queer. I refer to and cite black theorists who work under black queer trends and black feminism and black male studies and various other disciplines. I consider them as part of a broader corpus of black intellectual philosophy. I simply believe that the trajectory of the way that queer is employed no longer holds the revolutionary potential it previously held for me. However, I see great potential in trans and Sylvia Winter's conceptualization of genre. My analysis of my own condition begins with the black body, which in the words of philosopher George Yancey is marked as disgusting and is occluded from the realm of the conceptually white anthropos. Negresses, mulatresses, red, yellow, and brown people we have an existence laden with racial sexual stigma and stereotypes. Our flesh is marked. When my children entered this world, they were not simply assigned the gender. They were assigned a race, a measure of their worth in parahumanity or inhumanity. Did I give birth to a super predator, a breeder, a welfare princess, or a bed wench? However, I have never seen this concept of coercive biologism successfully applied where racialization is concerned. Thus, no one is chastising me about calling myself black or my cousins biracial. This is not, however, an attempt to give any credence to any half-baked theory of transracialism. Under an anglocratic racial or sexual caste or regime, those marked as other than white are laden with racialized stereotypes that affect us on various legal, economic, and social political levels. Presumed prostitutes, ghetto gaggers, fat, phallic, hypersexual, dangerous, diseased, and impotent. The skin itself becomes genital, along with epicanthal folds, big lips, big asses. In contrast, being legally, socioeconomically, or sociopolitically white has net positive effects generally. It's a different level of humanity. While Yancey and Calvin Warren named this non-being, I opt for disbeing a la mode de Sylvia Winter. One current talking point amongst black feminists centers the issue of black men referring to black women as females. The common feeling is that the word female is most often being used as a substitute for bitch. The point usually being made is along the lines of we're not animals, we are black women. Thus, the use of the word female as a substitute for woman in the case of black women is dehumanizing. I'm not here to dispute that. However, I find this reasoning ironic considering the most common equivalent referent for black men in general is nigga. Yes, this term refers to all black people, but generally the term is masculinized via negative racialization as black. Black men then are overrepresented as niggers, not due to their own masculinist privilege per se. Here I differentiate between privilege as a material benefit and chauvinism as in disdain for condescension toward the differently sex, as is commonly theorized. But because of the intricacies of racialized sexism 
and white heterogender boundaries that rely on a social expression of sexual dimorphism. Where the word nigga is concerned, similar appeals to humanity have been called out as part of the pushback against respectability politics. I want us to connect the appeal to humanity embedded in denouncing nigga and nigger to the appeal to womanhood where females is concerned. These two situations are similar enough that I think there's another issue afoot here having to do with what Zakia Iman Jackson named bestialization, what Af co-named zoological racism, what Monica Allward refers to as parahumanity, what Benedict de Beauceron describes as the inextricability of the animal and the black, and what Sylvia Winter refers to as genres of being human or naturally selected, i.e. eugenic, and naturally diselected. What I'm saying is, embedded in black women's appeal to womanhood is a protest against the relative inhumanity or parahumanity that being negatively racialized, thus negatively sexualized because of racism, females experience that positively racialized as white women do not experience or experience to a much lesser degree. Often when we use the term racialized, we refer to all non-white or less white people as being racialized, while white people are simply white people. This is similar to how we use queer and many other terms in many spaces. It's also a reminder that our categorical difference is more than just a racial or sexual difference. It is a categorical difference in levels of humanity or racial caste, as some call it. I argue that most contemporary and popular gender theories function not to destabilize sex gender categories in all related institutions, but to promote the absorption of legal language into common parlance and obscure the way the American racial caste system functions through mass criminalization. The idea is that the American black-white binary itself is a heterogender binary, and this fact is obscured by white feminists or white identified feminists' insistence and non-white feminist acceptance or failed revision of the fact, the idea that women constitute a subordinate heterogeneous class. Due to the nature of this theory, I don't believe an intersectional lens will do. Philosopher Tommy Curry formally introduced a reading of Kimberly Crenshaw's rendition of intersectionality as an extension of Catherine McKinnon's dominance theory in his 2017 book, The Man Not. In his 2021 paper, Decolonizing the Intersection, Black Male Studies as a Critique of Intersectionality's Indebtedness to Subculture of Violence Theory, Curry argues that intersectionality relies on a conceptualization of gender that allows the reconstitution of black female identity around the sameness and difference with black men and white women, while requiring black males to be theorized primarily through the sameness they share with men as patriarchs. In that same paper, he argues, Crenshaw's initial formulation of intersectional analysis depends on an understanding of racial patriarchy that is inextricably tied to dominance feminism's emphasis on physical violence and the criminological construct of the intra-racial rapist. The influence of dominance feminism and popular queer feminism is very felt these days, and it, is directly, it directly influenced Crenshaw's rendition of the concept of an intersectionality, which she herself called a provisional concept at one point. McKinnon's influence as a critical legal theorist cannot be understated, and she is also a force in anti-prostitution and anti-porn activism, recently pinning an op-ed in which she called only fans sex workers soft prostitutes. This affiliation between McKinnon and Crenshaw should not be overlooked in the era of mass criminalization. McKinnon's goal has always been to create and push legislation that supports her pornophobic goals. Intersectional feminism has clearly been co-opted and commodified, and I don't think it is up to the task of what I would be asking it to do. <sighs> we must also note how often queer and feminist constructions of black bodies work to disappear black and brown trans feminine people by subjecting people to the sneech like biomyth of born in the wrong body in order to realign our bodies with white heterogender ideals based on what is natural or unnatural difference. By linguistically displacing black, female, or male bodies and pathologizing 
blackness to a certain degree or discussion, we, lo we also lose access to black transmasculine experiences. We lose the ability to discuss black male and female entanglements. A linguistic chokehold means we lose vital, dynamic explanations for the violence that black people face that are deeply related to our blackened bodies and our unwillingness or inability to conform to various expectations of manhood or womanhood. We lose the ability to discuss the violence that black males and females face that are deeply related to hypersexualized and bestialized blackness. This is what I mean by entanglements. Like a bag of skeins of tangled yarn, you cannot simply pull one string and expect it to make a neat ball. You must diligently untangle, and still there's no guarantee that you will be able to reclaim every bit of string. Some of it will remain resistant to the ministrations of your mammalian vertebral phalanges. Some of it will remain opaque, as Glissant would say. Thus, we conclude that the problem is not just feminism or queer theory, but the application of anglocratic European humanist values to bodies that have been marked historically via negative racialization, thus negative sexualization as valueless or fungible. Black bodies marked as parahuman as a different genre of human. In order to get to the root of the issue, we must acknowledge the racial sexual entanglements that mark black bodies in particular as freakish and disgendered, and how those entanglements lead to a latent acceptance of black people's pariah sexualization, which I refer to as pornophobia. I remember reading an essay in Tony Cade Bambara's anthology, The Black Woman. It talked about how often black female and white females feminist goals differed because black women were constantly trying to figure out how to accommodate black men in their quest to achieve womanhood. I'm paraphrasing from memory, but the writer said that black women and white women typically didn't realize their goals were divergent until they were in the same room. Black women can't be women if black men cannot achieve manhood because those concepts work in tandem. And that to me signals that to a certain degree woman itself following Winter's conceptualization of the secular man too, as based in the Darwinian Malthusian concept of biology and scarcity as natural, is a hegemonic thus racialized concept that is inaccessible to the lot of us as long as white supremacy reigns because those, the white women in the same room with them didn't have to fight to be considered women. They either want to move on from what they consider reductive or essentialist concepts like race, or like McKinnon, they want to create legislation that continues the racialized history of protecting white womanhood under the guise of protection for all women. The latter necessarily also excludes other groups of those called freaks, deviant, disabled, impaired, and this animal-human, parahuman triad that become placed outside of humanity. I see this reproduction of history in the present, from queer theory to feminism and beyond, and I wonder what can be done for us to become new. Scholar, co-coordinator for Spokes Hub. So as you can see, sex workers have a lot of different experiences and a lot of different ways of looking at the world and a lot to share. So this was the first cohort that just graduated. We're immensely proud. We're really thankful of Woodhull for providing this platform and space to conduct this experiment. Um, the second cohort is going to be opening up, uh, we're going to be putting out calls sort of mid-August, so if you know people who might like to apply, uh, they are welcome to. It will continue to be focused on people with experience in the sex trade. In the future, Woodhull might expand it to other issue areas as well. And something interesting to know about Spokes Hub is clearly the people who spoke today have a lot of experience and, and real knowledge to share. Society needs to hear this, right? These people are experts in their experience and they're experts about certain aspects of society and things that could change to improve outcomes for a lot of people. And um, they should be compensated for their good work. Uh, social justice advocacy work is not always compensated. So Spokes Hub uh, provides a financial awards pool for its graduates. So as they go out in the world, if they are talking to journalists, classrooms, potential allies, uh, not lobbying, unfortunately. We'll get there someday, 501c4, you know how it is. But um, 
they will have access to this financial awards pool to compensate them for this good work. And also, as we or any of you find similar opportunities, you're welcome to contact Woodhull, uh, CC Spokes Hub, and say, you know, people want to talk to your advocates, and we'll make sure that they are rewarded for that good work. So um, before we wrap it up, I just wanted to offer if anybody has any final thoughts for the evening, um, especially Molly, thinking of you out there in the world on Zoom, if there's anything that people want to say, um, now's the time before we wrap it up. Molly, do you have anything? Yeah, i just like to thank everybody that has helped with um, getting me out of the car and out of the hotel and helping me on this journey. I still have a lot of work to do and uh, progress to make, but uh, Swap Behind Bars has um, helped me tremendously. So I just would like to make that known. And um Specifically at Swap Behind Bars, I want to give a shout out to Melanie Dante, who has just really gone above and beyond helping to get Melissa's story together. I also want to give a shout out to all the operators on the sex worker community support line at Swap Behind Bars, literally answering the phones when current and former sex workers, survivors of exploitation and human trafficking, allies, researchers, everybody calls this line. Um, and uh, that's how some of us have met. Uh, yeah, that's how we uh, met Nikki, that's how we met Molly, and, um, and so many other great people. Um, is there anything that anyone else wanted to add? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I just wanted to, on the record, thank um, some of the people on Twitter who kept supporting me throughout the online harassment and all the things that I was experiencing. Um, I ended up being like, for some reason, like ostracized from a certain part of like the black feminist community because of some of the critiques that I've made about different things that were going on that I didn't appreciate, especially considering my placement as a sex worker and everything like that. I experienced a lot, you know, regarding that and being a single mom at, a, at one point. So um, I'm really grateful to the other black scholars on social media who have reached out to me and um, especially um, like 8BZ, Rennie Ture and Dr. Curry who, you know, they're all like scholars, PhDs and everything and they made time to like reach out to me personally and affirm the type of scholarship that I was doing in a way that it wasn't before. And I appreciate Savannah for that same reason, just being in Spokes Hub and being able to like speak freely on my ideas and us having that back and forth, despite the fact that we come from such very different backgrounds, it was just, it was very, it was very great for me to have, to see that someone else, like who's not even from where I'm from, can understand what I'm saying or ask questions and not like immediately like feel attacked, you know? So like, I've always appreciated Savannah for that and that's why we kept in touch over the few years and everything, so, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's awesome working with you and I can't wait to do this second cohort. I'm gonna rock it. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to our first Spokes Hub graduation. Hopefully there will be many more. We hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.